The Tigray conflict, which started as a so-called policing operation, has devolved into a violent, ethnically-based civil war, with some commentators making comparisons to the Yugoslav Wars and predicting the breakup of Ethiopia. How did Ethiopia polarize along ethnic lines? Could it lead to the same kind of ethnic cleansing and violent state collapse that we saw during the breakup of Yugoslavia? And what approach can unite Ethiopia to prevent the collapse? All that in this video. Only 40% of you are subscribed and only 15% of you have the bell notification on. So be sure to subscribe and hit that bell notification. Ethnic Polarization To understand the current Ethiopian conflict, we have to understand how ethnicity became politicized in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, like Yugoslavia, is an incredibly diverse country with over 80 different ethnic groups. The largest are the Oromo, who are 35% of the population, the Amhara, who are 26%, the Somali, who are 6%, and the Tigrayans, who are just 6%. Religion is another cleavage, with 62% being Christians, while about 32% are Muslims. Christians, in turn, are divided two to one between the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and various Protestant denominations. Indeed, there are many parallels between Ethiopia's current political structure and that of Yugoslavia before its collapse. Before 1991, Ethiopia was a single-party communist state, and before 1974, it was a semi-feudal absolute monarchy. The communist government was overthrown in 1991 by a coalition of ethnically based parties called the EPRDF, or Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front. The EPRDF was ostensibly an equal partnership between different ethnically based parties. In truth, however, it was dominated by the TPLF, or Tigrayan People's Liberation Front. Just like in Yugoslavia, the EPRDF combined an authoritarian political system with a system of ethnic federalism. This system divided Ethiopia into nine ethnically based states who could govern their own internal affairs using their own languages and even had a constitutional right to secede from Ethiopia. And this system was introduced to redress long-held ethnic grievances in the country. In Yugoslavia, before communism, Croatian fascists had dominated the country. And before that, Serbs had been the dominant ethnic group. Similarly, in Ethiopia, while it was never colonized by any European power, like many historical kingdoms, it incorporated multiple ethnic groups through a combination of intermarriage and conquest, with the dominant ethnic group being the Amhara. In fact, much of the ethnic nationalism in Ethiopia today can be traced back to the 1960s, when Emperor Haile Selassie tried to modernize the country amongst others by promoting the Amhara language and culture as the sole national language. This came at the expense of other languages and cultures. For instance, the Oromo language was completely banned from use in education and in administrative matters. While ethnic federalism brought significant gains in terms of cultural autonomy, in practice, the system was dominated by the TPLF, with Tigrayans occupying a disproportionate share of government positions at all levels, including the military. By creating ethnically-based regional states, Ethiopia, just like Yugoslavia, solidified ethnicity as the basis of political organization. This created two problems. Number one is that by linking each state to the local ethnic majority, you create a system where the so-called original ethnic groups in their respective regions are empowered at the expense of local minorities. Suddenly, there is a push for states to become homogenous, and so people of a different ethnic group are seen as settlers or newcomers who don't belong, and this has led to many instances of people being kicked out of their homes for belonging to the wrong ethnic group. In fact, the constitutions of some regional states even explicitly state that sovereignty rests with the majority group, excluding minorities. It has also led to increasing border conflicts between different regional states and also with ethnic groups who are too small to have their own state, such as the Sindama. Number two is that because federal funds are allocated on the basis of ethnicity, Politicians are incentivized to operate on ethnic lines and form ethnic parties as an ethnic group having its own administrative division grants them access to federal funding, local resources, and political power. On top of that, many administrative posts are allocated on the basis of ethnicity rather than merit. 
and so the result is that ethnicity is both politicized and made into a static permanent identity. This ignores the fact that many Ethiopians are ethnically mixed and multilingual. People migrate between different ethnic regions and ethnicity and culture evolve over time. Ethnicity is a social construct, not a primordial characteristic. By placing the emphasis on ethnicity, you ignore people's other identities and prevent the formation of a common Ethiopian identity. The ethnic inequality created by this system inevitably produced ethnic tensions and resentment at the dominance of the TPLF. While the TPLF was able to maintain relative stability and rapid economic growth through a combination of Chinese-style authoritarianism and rapid industrialization, it was only a matter of time before these tensions came bubbling to the surface. The Road to Civil War In 2018, the TPLF effectively lost power. I go into more detail in my previous Ethiopia video, link in the description, but basically what happened is that mass protests led by Oromo youths forced the EPRDF to appoint Abiy Ahmed an Oromo as Prime Minister. Two things followed from this, the opening up of the political space and the sidelining of the TPLF within the EPRDF coalition. After the death of Tito, Yugoslavia slowly began to allow more political freedoms but because of the ethno-federal structure, it opened up the path for ethno-nationalist forces to gain a voice and use that structure to gain power. Similarly, in Ethiopia, democratic reforms opened up the political space, but also allowed for the opening of old wounds from long-held grievances. Using the new political freedoms, ethno-nationalist political movements have mobilized in all regions of Ethiopia. Inter-ethnic violence has increased, with up to 3 million people being displaced as a result. And that was before the war. And in order to respond to this, Abiy Ahmed's government has increasingly relied on authoritarian measures. Meanwhile, the TPLF was sidelined as key TPLF figures were fired and some even put on trial for corruption. Abiy Ahmed then dissolved the EPRDF and formed a new multi-ethnic political party called the Prosperity Party. The Amhara and Oromo factions of the EPRDF quickly joined the new party, but the TPLF refused to join. Now, it's critical to understand that this conflict was not just ethnic. You see, during the EPRDF era, the TPLF elites had control over the commanding heights of the Ethiopian economy. This included the $3.5 billion that came from foreign aid, the rents from the 3.6 million hectares of land that was leased out to foreign investors, and the revenues from state-owned enterprises. It is this which the TPLF is fighting for, not ordinary Tigrayans. Ethnicity is just a tool for mobilization. As the TPLF was sidelined, they grew increasingly resentful and retreated back to Tigray. The final straw came in 2020 when Abiy Ahmed postponed the elections because of the coronavirus, which would mean that Abiy Ahmed would be in power longer than the constitution allows. In response, in September 2020, the TPLF decided to hold its own elections in the Tigray region, which it won by overwhelming numbers. And so because of this, the TPLF argued that the federal government no longer had any authority because its term had expired. The federal government refused to recognize the legitimacy of the election, and soon after, TPLF forces reportedly attacked federal military headquarters in Tigray. The civil war had begun. Abiy Ahmed sent federal forces into Tigray, aided by the Eritrean army and Amhara militias, and by December 2020, he declared victory. But what had really happened was that TPLF forces had retreated into the mountains and continued to wage a guerrilla campaign. In an effort to starve out the guerrillas, Abiy Ahmed blocked humanitarian aid to Tigray, leading to mass displacement of civilians and starvation. On top of that, reports show that atrocities and mass killings have been perpetrated against the civilian population. In June 2021, in order to bolster his legitimacy, Abiy Ahmed finally held national elections. Yet due to the violence, elections could not be held in several regions and many opposition parties boycotted the elections. Abiy Ahmed's Prosperity Party won an overwhelming majority of seats but how free or fair the election was is questionable, although Abiy Ahmed undoubtedly does still have real support. By June 2021, federal forces had been pushed out and the TPLF was gaining ground. Part of this was due to an effective use of guerrilla tactics in Tigray's mountainous landscape. 
But the other aspect is that the TPLF has many of Ethiopia's best trained and most experienced soldiers, some of whom led the fight against the communist regime back in the 80s. By November 2021, the TPLF had pushed federal forces all the way back to within 200 kilometers of the capital, entering the Amhara and Afar regions where they in turn committed horrific atrocities against the civilian population. It was at this point that the TPLF announced an alliance with eight other nationalist rebel groups in Ethiopia, including the Oromo Liberation Front OLF, which is also waging a guerrilla war against the government in Oromia. This was the moment when many foreign media outlets incorrectly predicted the fall of the Ethiopian government. In a desperate move, Abiy Ahmed transferred his duties of prime minister to his deputy, went to the front lines and took direct command of the military. He also held huge rallies in Addis Ababa, rallying thousands to defend the homeland. This renewed effort, combined with Turkish drones, allowed the federal government to reverse the advances of the TPLF. At this moment, TPLF forces have retreated back to Tigray and the conflict appears to be in stalemate. So how much of this conflict is like Yugoslavia and how likely is the breakup of Ethiopia? Yugoslavia 2.0 Ethiopia, like Yugoslavia in the 90s, is in the midst of an ethnically based civil war. Just like Yugoslavia, mass atrocities have been committed on all sides, but there are differences. And depending on how this scenario plays out, Ethiopia could either fracture or be held together by force. There are six scenarios. TPLF victory. In November 2021, it looked like an alliance of the TPLF and OLF was going to capture the capital. Had this happened, the TPLF would have inherited a fractured country that hates them. This would make it very difficult for them to maintain control and could force the TPLF to grant even more autonomy to the regions, transforming the country from a federation to a confederation. Alternatively, without a common enemy, the OLF would see no reason to continue cooperating with the TPLF. The OLF is an Oromo nationalist organization that seeks independence for Oromia and critically, it sees Addis Ababa as historically part of Oromia. In such a scenario, with the TPLF being unable to maintain control over the country, the OLF would likely declare Oromo independence, triggering a domino effect of other regions declaring independence and plunging the country into total war. Ethnic minorities who live in the wrong region would be chased out in a violent campaign of ethnic cleansing. This is the worst case scenario and most like Yugoslavia. Military coup Another possibility is that if the TPLF would continue making gains, Abi Ahmed's own military would lose faith in his leadership, leading to a military coup. The coup leaders would either install a more competent leader or push for a negotiated settlement with the TPLF. The federal government's recent victories under Abiy Ahmed's leadership, however, make this scenario unlikely. Total victory. Now that the TPLF has been forced to retreat back into Tigray, another possibility would be that federal forces launch a second invasion of Tigray and achieve total victory over the TPLF. This would likely be accompanied by severe atrocities against the Tigrayan people. Abiy's government has been careful to claim that it is fighting a battle against the TPLF, not the people of Tigray. But its actions, including the removal of many Tigrayans from government positions, ethnic profiling, mass atrocities against Tigrayan civilians, and blocking humanitarian aid to Tigray have undermined this claim. There is a very real possibility that if federal forces take over Tigray, that there will be violent ethnic cleansing just like Yugoslavia. The only difference being that the country will not break up but be held together by blood and force. A negotiated settlement. With TPLF forces in retreat and federal forces waiting on the Tigrayan border, it would be a good time for a ceasefire and a negotiated settlement. Military action alone cannot resolve this conflict. In this scenario, the federal government would negotiate with the TPLF and perhaps the TPLF would agree to lay down its arms in exchange for greater regional autonomy, funds to rebuild Tigray and guaranteed humanitarian access. This would lead to an uneasy peace, but it would prevent unnecessary bloodshed and bring an end to the war. Secession 
Another possibility is that the TPLF sees the writing on the wall. They realize that they are not strong enough to overthrow Abi Ahmed, but they still have the strength to defend Tigray. In a desperate move, the TPLF could issue a unilateral declaration of independence under Article 39 of the Constitution. While this could technically be legal under Ethiopian law, it would most likely not be recognized by the international community and would almost certainly lead to a federal government invasion to stop it. But if the TPLF can hold its own, it could achieve de facto independence for Tigray. Such a move could trigger similar attempts in other regions and lead to instability across the country. Although at this moment, the federal government would probably still maintain control. Stalemate. This is in fact the current situation. Neither side appears capable of defeating the other. At the same time, no one is willing to back down. Abiy Ahmed insists on labeling the TPLF as terrorists and refuses to negotiate with them, while the TPLF has made accusations of genocide. If a continued stalemate does not lead to a negotiated settlement, then it will most likely lead to a lengthening of the civil war. This will only result in more death, more destruction, and the economic ruin of Ethiopia. Everybody will lose. How likely are these scenarios and how similar are they to what happened in Yugoslavia? There are two key differences with Yugoslavia. Number one is that the federal government maintains far more control at the moment than the Yugoslavia government ever did. With the exception of Tigray, most of the country is under federal government control. While there are OLF and ONLF rebels in Oromia and Somali, they don't control much territory and continue to operate as guerrilla fighters. The other difference is that the TPLF, at least originally, was not fighting for Tigrayan independence. Instead, TPLF elites were fighting against the loss of their positions of power. Indeed, they could have easily declared independence when they had the upper hand instead of attempting to capture Addis Ababa. However, their goals may have evolved. Realizing that retaking control of the country is impossible, the only alternative for them is to declare independence and TPLF leaders have already hinted at this. Other groups who are explicitly fighting for independence, the OLF and the ONLF, are not in a position to achieve it, which makes a total breakup less likely. What is most like Yugoslavia, however, is the ethnically based character of the war and the violent ethnic atrocities that have taken place. The federal government has massacred thousands of Tigrayan civilians and the TPLF has massacred thousands of Amhara and Afar civilians. In the rest of the country, Tigrayans are being fired from their jobs and 15,000 Tigrayan members of the military and 30,000 Tigrayan civilians are being held in internment camps near Addis Ababa. The possibility of ethnic cleansing against the Tigrayan people is very real. Whichever way this war goes, Ethiopia needs a solution to unite the country and bring an end to the ethnic violence that could lead to a Yugoslavia-style breakup. Medemer Medemer is an Amharic word meaning coming together. It is also the name of Abiy Ahmed's philosophy which he describes in his book of the same name. Medemer, as Abiy Ahmed sees it, entails different ethnic groups uniting together to achieve a common purpose and developing a transcendent national identity over and above their respective ethnic identities. This flowery rhetoric contrasts sharply with the hate speech that has come from Abiy Ahmed, referring to his enemies as cancer, weeds, rats and terrorists, as the distinction between TPLF and Tigrayan grows even more blurry. How can the spirit of Medemer be achieved in practice in this toxic environment? Even if the federal government wins, Ethiopia remains a deeply divided society and the same ethnic tensions that led to the conflict continue to fester. Only force is holding the country together right now. But this cannot last forever. Ethiopia will need to rebuild not just its infrastructure, but its national identity and the unifying bonds between its citizens. Atrocities committed by both sides have broken trust between ethnic groups, which will have to be rebuilt. As the location of the African Union headquarters, it can learn from the experiences of other African countries. Just like South Africa after apartheid, it will need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to redress the grievances and atrocities committed by all sides during this war. It will also need to begin the process of nation-building, developing a common language and national symbols as a source of unity. 
Tanzania adopted Swahili as a unifying language and has no ethnic tensions despite its diversity, while other countries use the colonial language as a unifying language. However, in Ethiopia there is no colonial language because it was never colonized, and while Amharic has historically served as a lingua franca, it was pushed onto other cultures while their own languages were neglected or even actively suppressed. Thus, unlike Swahili in Tanzania, it is not a neutral language, and enshrining it as a national language could be seen as some kind of ethnic favoritism. Instead, perhaps some form of multilingualism, as in Canada or South Africa, will have to do. The country will also need common national symbols, but this is also difficult. Potentially, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church could serve as a unifying force, but the church itself is rife with ethnic divisions, and only about half of Ethiopians subscribe to this church, with the remainder belonging to other Christian denominations or other religions. Even a sense of pride in Ethiopian history has grown increasingly contentious as ethno-nationalist voices have come to dominate the discussion. While many Ethiopians, especially in the Amhara community, revere Emperor Menelik II, who defeated the Italians in the 19th century, others see him as a conqueror of their people. Thus, with ethno-nationalist sentiments disrupting the formation of a common language, common religion, or common identity, there is a disturbing lack of shared meanings that can bring people together across ethnic lines. All this has been facilitated by the existence of successive leaders who have favored their own ethnic group, be it the Amhara, the Tigray, or the Oromo, creating resentments among the rest of the population. Ethiopia's ethno-federal structure, rather than mitigating those tensions, has only entrenched ethnicity as the basis of political mobilization and resource allocation. This lasted as long as the country was dominated by a de facto one-party state under the EPRDF. But as soon as the political space opened up, the ethnic federal system gave precisely the wrong incentives to political actors who saw that ethnicity was the best way to generate political support. Every aspect of this ethno-federal system is pushing the country apart, with only force keeping it together. Ethiopia must reform this system of ethnic federalism if it is to survive. Nigeria and Kenya, both ethnically divided societies, have federal or devolved systems where the regional states are not explicitly based on ethnicity, but still small enough and relatively ethnically homogenous enough to mitigate ethnic tension. Ethiopia's current system will only lead to each ethnic group demanding its own state, border conflicts between states, removing ethnic minorities from their land, and eventually demands for independence. The ethnic states should be broken up into smaller federal units, and ethnicity should no longer be placed at the center of political organization. If Ethiopia cannot achieve this, then a violent Yugoslavia-style collapse is not only likely, it is inevitable. Due to the sensitive nature of this topic, this video will likely be demonetized. So consider becoming a Patreon to support the channel. Leave a comment for the algorithm. Thank you to my Patreons, including Linda, Richard, Eisenskjold, and many more for making this video possible. Like, share, and subscribe. Cause this was my take.